Let's pray together this morning. Jesus, I am increasingly aware the older I get, the more unworthy I am to even read your name, much less say it or sing it or declare that I am in you, that I am yours, adopted into your family. How unworthy I am and we are to celebrate your name. A name that for all eternity will fill us with joy and purpose and life and freedom. And so I pray this morning in the powerful and awesome and good name of Jesus that you would do immeasurably more here today than we have ever asked or even comprehended. That, Father, you would save people today who need to be saved. Set them free adopted into your family today. And God, those who are saved, I pray as we look at your word this morning that you would sanctify them in your truth. Father, as we we spend time reflecting here in just a moment through the Lord's Supper on your death, your burial, and your resurrection, Father, I pray that you would work mightily within our hearts. And I pray that you would do awesome things as we get out of your way and you use us. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want to say to you, welcome. Uh, My name is Blake, and I have the honor and the privilege to be the teaching pastor here. And before we go further with this service, we want to give you an opportunity to pause and to worship Christ through the Lord's Supper. Maybe you're familiar with the Lord's Supper, maybe you're not, but I want to explain a little bit of what what the Lord's Supper is. It is a moment to do two things, two things, that Jesus inaugurated it, initiated it there the night that before he was betrayed, where he took bread and he took wine and he had that with his disciples and he compared it to his body and his blood that was broken and then he calls us to do the same until he returns and we get to have it again with him in heaven. But it's a moment to do two things for each person here today. One, it's a moment of celebration where you celebrate the fact that Jesus' body was broken for you. He took on your sin. He became it. And then second, it is a moment for us to examine. Celebration and examination. It's a moment for us to pause, to see if there's any sin bitterness, unforgiveness in our hearts and in our lives and to give that back to the Lord because He died and resurrected for those things that no longer be in our hearts. But sometimes they can. It's a moment for the church to examine their hearts. But it's also a moment for people who are here this morning to examine your eternal life. You know, the, the Word tells us that if someone takes of the Lord's Supper and then is not a follower of Jesus, has not been born again, They are reaping judgment on their heads because they're declaring, I know what Jesus did for me, but I am not personally partaking of it. And so this is also a morning. We've multiple mornings that we've had the Lord's Supper. We've had somebody give their life to Jesus because they've realized they don't know Christ. They have not been saved by Jesus. They may have prayed a prayer. They may have grown up in church, but they're not born again. And so this is a moment for us of celebration and examination. So I want to invite you here in just a moment to just spend time praying, spend time reflecting. And so I want to read you a passage of Scripture, and then I'm going to give you that moment, that time to pause, as Psalm 46 says, to be still before the Lord. I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul gives very clear instruction in verse 27 on how we should take the Lord's Supper. He says, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person, this is so important, let a person examine himself or herself so that they may eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so this moment, I'm going to give you time 
just to reflect, to simply pray, God, examine my heart. Show me any sin, any unforgiveness, any bitterness, any anxiousness. And God, I give it to you right now. So I'm going to pray over you just briefly, and then you spend that time with your heads bound, your eyes closed, just getting right before the Lord and examining yourself. I'm going to pray. Father, I pray that this moment, each soul here, each soul joining us online, would examine themselves, confess sin, that they would get right with you this morning, and that their hearts would be ready to celebrate you through the Lord's Supper. Jesus name now you spend these few moments praying examining your heart confessing sin slander bitterness you get right with Jesus this morning Spirit, let your presence permeate this place this morning. Let your sweet kindness and conviction bring repentance in our hearts and our lives so that we may most fully celebrate Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to invite you, if you have the cup, uh, to, to bring that out. And if you don't have that, that we have deacons in the back. If you just raise your hand, and, and they can bring that to you right now. So just raise your hand, and they'll bring that to you. And I want to encourage you as well that if you're a parent here and your child is here with you, I want to encourage you, uh, if that child has not yet made a profession of faith, uh, then let this be a teaching moment for them. Uh, that if they have not been born again and baptized, uh, let that be a teaching moment for them, explaining to them what we do, because this is a privilege. This is an honorable thing that we get to do as followers of Jesus. But if that child has not yet made a decision, uh, I would encourage you to not let them partake of the Lord's Supper yet. That that time, that first time after they're saved is a moment of celebration for them. So for those of you who have the cup and you've examined your hearts and you're ready to remind yourself of Jesus' body and blood, I want to read to you a passage of scripture that Paul wrote again in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul tells the church, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So church, I want to invite you to just slide open the very top of that cup take the bread and take that together let's pray Lord Jesus thank you for your body that was broken for us that became our sin not a representative of our sin you bore our sins in your body on the tree and so we thank you that your body was broken for us in Jesus name and he goes on and he says in verse 25 in the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, innocent blood from the very beginning, from Genesis 3, had to be shed on behalf of the guilty. And so Jesus was starting a new covenant with his blood. No longer the blood of bulls and goats and lambs had to be offered for the forgiveness of sins, that he was going to offer his blood once for all, for all sins. And us drinking this is us reminding ourselves and each other that Christ's blood was shed for you and for each other. So I want to encourage you now to drink of his blood in remembrance of him. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your body, for your blood. And I pray in the name of Jesus 
that as we examine your word, that Lord, you would work powerfully in this moment, that we would get out of your way and you would work here like only you can. I pray that today you would save people and I pray that today you would sanctify your church. And we pray and ask all these things in the awesome and good and holy and adventurous name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus, the lion and the lamb. Jesus, the promise fulfilled. Jesus, the great I am. Jesus, the true and better. Jesus, the faithful friend. Jesus, the Messiah and Savior. Jesus, the firm foundation. Any and every foundation we lay stake our hope in is nothing compared to Jesus because Jesus is better than all. Amen. Amen. I miss you, dude. I miss you. I'm glad you're back. So excited. Listen, I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to the book of Hebrews. That's where we're going to be for the majority of 2023 is in this book, looking at the centrality, the power, the awesomeness, the goodness of Jesus in an ever-shifting world and an ever-shifting lives, the book of Hebrews balances us, focuses us on the powerful and awesomeness of Christ. And uh, as you're doing that, if you don't have a Bible, the passage will be here on the screen. It's also there in your notes. But I want to draw your attention to the uh, stage for a second to look at something that I am very grateful for. This is uh, an anchor. Uh, This is actually my kayaking anchor. So whenever I go out, or on lakes or wherever I go, uh, this is typically with me, and I use this for multiple reasons. One, if I find a place that I think is good for fishing, I will drop it down and and, uh, I'll kind of settle there and this will hold me there. I also set it down during times where the water is moving so quickly and I want to slow down or I even want to stop. Uh, Maybe there's a reason that I want to stop. Maybe there's somebody who's tipped over and I kind of want to get to them. And so uh, this anchor I'm super grateful for. And the reason this anchor works is for multiple reasons. One, it's because it's heavy. Uh, it's, it's got some pretty good weight to it. Here, here, feel this real quick. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, do you like that, that little trick? Okay. Uh, it's heavy. Uh, it's uh, uh, probably some type of lead or lead-like material, so it's, it's, it's got some weight to it. Because if it was not very much weight to it, it really wouldn't hold on to much or it wouldn't really sit at the bottom or wouldn't sink. Uh, the second thing that this thing has is it's got these little arms right here. Y'all can see those kind of dropping in and out. Those, those will snag a rock, a stick, uh, just the ground, uh, the bottom of the river or lake. It'll, it'll hold on to that, so that's helpful. The other thing, though, that I think is pretty important is this string right here. You know, you don't have this string, and uh, you can drop the anchor, and it can do all those things, and you're going to keep floating. <laughs> uh, you're going to need this string to attach you uh, to whatever is floating, or, or excuse me, it, to, to hold you. If you don't have it, then you're pretty much lost. There's, there's multiple reasons why this anchor is so important to me whenever I'm on the river or the lake or wherever I'm going. And so the reason that I'm drawing our attention this morning to this anchor is because it helps me. It helps me slow down or stop. It anchors me when things get really chaotic and crazy and wild and, and uncontrollable on the river. It stops me whenever things are really great and I want to stay in that place. It holds me together when everything else is wanting to take me downriver. And the reason why I'm I'm sharing that and and illustrating that in, in that way is because this anchor is a very powerful illustration for how Jesus operates. That our lives, as we looked at last week and the week before, our lives are crazy. Remember we talked about how our lives are like Arkansas weather. You know, one day it's sunny and 70, the next day there's a tornado warning, the next day it's going to snow or ice. I mean, those all happen within a week in Arkansas. It's crazy, and I oftentimes said that our souls feel like that. They're chaotic. They're all over the place. They're like a kayak or a canoe on a river with no, with no anchor, with no weight. You're just at the mercy of whatever's happening. A lot of us feel like that a lot of times. Matter of fact, some of you are here this morning, and you feel like you are adrift. You're all over the place. Life is spinning out of control. And you need an anchor. You need something to balance you, to weight you down, to stop you or to pause you or to help you get stability for a second. Jesus is a lot like this anchor. He's a lot like this 
this apparatus, this tool. And this tool, like I said, has multiple ways in which it's helpful. Jesus himself has multiple ways, multiple ministries that he is the anchor of our lives. There's multiple things that Jesus does that anchors us in times of chaos. And I just want to encourage you with something. Your and my life will always be in the moments of chaos. I got to talk with uh, someone here at the church today, and I told them about how our lives are not like a bar graph. They're not like, oh, things are great, things are awful. Things are great, things are awful. Matter of fact, Adrian Rogers says that our lives are like train tracks. On the one track is God's blessing and God's favor and your kids are acting right and your job is going well and and things are going great for you. On the other side of the track are hardship and difficulties, frustrations, anger, sin, sins of other people. Very frustrating things are happening on this side of the tracks. And the thing about train tracks is trains never ride on one side or the other. They always ride on both. Your life is the train, and you are always going to have chaos and, 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 and burdens alongside blessing and favor. That is always going to exist for you. So how can you and I be anchored by Jesus Christ in the midst of chaotic times? Jesus in John 17 said, in this world you're going to have trouble. So if you're here this morning and you have trouble in your life, There's something that's going on that is you're battling with, that you are struggling with, that you are mad at God even about. Then I want to encourage you to look at the components of Jesus' ministry, how he is and can be an anchor for your life from Hebrews chapter 2. And my encouragement to you, the application for you today is to drop the anchor. And not leave it. I mean drop it into the soil of this life and let the anchor hold you. But I want us to see this morning what the anchor of Jesus Christ does for us in our short time together this morning. So let's dive into Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 5. If you want to be anchored by Jesus Christ, you want to know what he brings to the table in regards to his ministry, then I want you to see from Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 5, the magnificent ministry of of Jesus. What does he have to offer us to anchor our souls in times of chaos? So join with me in verse 5 as we look at Jesus' ministry. For he did not subject to angels the world to come. That passage there, he is referring to God. And uh, he did not, God did not subject to angle, angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him? Or the Son of Man, that you are concerned about Him. You have made Him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned Him with glory and honor and have appointed Him over the works of your hands. In verse 8, you have put all things in subjection under His feet. For in subjecting all things to Him, He left nothing that is not subject to Him. But now, this is so important, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to Him. Let's pray this morning as we dive into the four components of Jesus' anchoring ministry. Father, I pray that you truly would remove me from this platform, that I would preach as though I'll never preach again, and that your people and all those who are within earshot of this sermon would listen as though this would be the last sermon they hear. Father, I pray that you would anchor the lives of people in this room, not with me, not with a sermon, not with a song, but with the solid rock of Jesus Christ and his ministry. Lord, his ability to hold us in the midst of chaos. And so, Father, I pray that you would do an awesome work, that you would save people today, you would sanctify your church, and it would all be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The first ministry of Jesus that we see from this passage of Scripture is that Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is sovereign. And we know that because the author immediately, five times, this is important, five times in four verses uses the word subject. He subjected. He was subjected. He is under subjection. Five different times in four verses. He is really trying to make a point here. And so we need to understand what the word subject means. It's the Greek word hypatso, and it means to bring under the control of. So what the author is saying out of the, out of the gate is that Jesus Christ is sovereign or he is in complete control over what? What does it say? All the works of, his, of God's hands, all things are in subjection under his feet and all things are to him and nothing, listen to this, nothing is not subject to him. Verse 8. 
So what the author is trying to start off from the very beginning is Jesus is in control of every component of human life now and for eternity to come. That there's not one problem, one issue, one addiction, one, one, one trial that you are walking through that Jesus Christ is not in control of. That Jesus Christ is not over. That he is not subjecting over or sovereign over your life. We get to thinking that. We oftentimes think like the dad in the passage of Scripture who had the son who was a demoniac in the New Testament. Who says says to Jesus, I believe, help my own belief. What he was ultimately saying is, I know that you can, I just don't think you can do it in my life. We are tempted to believe that Jesus Christ is not sovereign over every component and aspect of our life. But the author here is reminding us that when you look at Jesus, the first tool that you see with Christ is that he's sovereign. He is in complete control. There is nothing outside his reign and rule. And yet I want to make a powerful personal point that he makes before we go to this next truth. At the very end of verse 8, he makes this grand statement about how awesome and sovereign Jesus is. And then look at this. This is where you see the humanity of the author coming through, but it's still inspired by Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But now, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. You may not have caught that. You may not even realize what I'm trying to make here at this point. Here's what he's saying Jesus is sovereign, he is in complete control. But the problem is, we don't always see it like that. We can't yet see it. It's what I'm calling blurred sovereignty. It's this idea that that something happens in our world or in our life or with our home or with our children. And we immediately are like, how is God in control of this? Like, how in the world is Jesus sovereign over this? That's like, that's the tension of this life. That's where faith comes in. That's why faith is so vital. Because even though Jesus is sovereign, you and I cannot see his sovereignty played out all the time. Because we see it. You hear people all the time. How can a good God let these things happen? How can a good God let this place burn down? How can a good God let this person pass away? There's no way. That's exactly what this author is saying. We don't see yet his sovereignty fully displayed. It's blurred. A family member of mine recently had cataract surgery. And uh, I didn't quite understand exactly what that is, but in essence, it's where they go in and, and take these cataracts off their eyes. And this family member has for years not been able to see. They, they've had to have glasses. Matter of fact, I've, since I've known them, they've always worn glasses. And so just recently, they had this surgery and, and was talking to us, and, and I was talking to them over the Christmas break, and they had their glasses down towards their nose, and, and, and they said, yeah, I, I have to wear my glasses down here because I still have to wear them sometimes to read, but the problem is now I have 20-20 vision. I've never had it before in my life, so I can see perfectly. Matter of fact, the glasses are actually messing up my eyes. And they were celebrating the fact that for the first time in decades, they could see. Their whole life was just blurred, blurred vision without their glasses. But then once the surgery took place, they can see clearly. And as I thought about this passage of Scripture, I thought, man, what a powerful example of Jesus' sovereignty. See, we're going to walk through this life with blurred vision in regards to His sovereignty. We're not going to be able to fully see it, fully grasp it, fully understand it. But there's coming a day... For every single one of us who are born again, there is coming a day where everything that we have not fully understand, not completely comprehended in God's grand plan, will one day be displayed and fully understood that there is a cataract surgery of our soul coming when we get to heaven where our eyes are open and we realize, wow, that's what you were doing this whole time. I had no idea that that was what you were working, how you were orchestrating that, how you were bringing all that together. I didn't get it. I didn't grasp it when I was here on earth, but I see it now. And you have an eternity's worth of praise for him. Because you may be experiencing, you and I both experiencing blurred sovereignty now, but I can assure you he is on his throne. He is sovereign. Everything is subject to him and he will win. And every part and component of your life and world's history will bow their knees in subjection to Jesus Christ. Here's the second ministry that Jesus has. Not only is he sovereign, but Jesus saves. Look back with me in verse 9. We're going to walk through this passage with each of these truths, these ministries. 
Verse 9, Jesus saves. Well, we do not see him who has made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. He's literally declaring, hey, we don't see him now, but we know he exists. Because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, we might taste or he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things, and through whom all things, in bringing many sons, or sons and daughters, to glory, to perfect, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. The second ministry that we see here, there's multiple things that he's highlighting, he's going to bring up here at the end of this passage, but what he is highlighting is his death for bringing sons and daughters to glory. Jesus saves. And he saves those who are rebellious and those who are religious. There's there's two types of people who are saved. It's the prodigal son plays it out perfectly. You have one son who runs away, who squanders all of his life, everything that his father gave him. He's the rebel. He goes and lives wildly, loose women, Scripture tells us, and and drunkenness and and carousing. He just goes and does whatever he wants to. He, He just loses it. And then he comes back to the father and And begs for mercy. And the father, you know the story, runs out to meet the son who has literally told his dad, I want you dead. Give me your inheritance. I wish you were dead. And he runs out to the rebel and he saves them. Some of you, that's your story. You are the rebel. You have defied, run, rebelled against God, done everything and anything you could do to not align yourself with Jesus and to turn your back on him. And the truth is, he still will save you. There is no sin that you've committed or will commit that is not covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. But there's a second type of lost person. It's the religious lost person. It's the older brother. See, the older brother stays at the house. He does what he's supposed to do. He works. He never complains. He just does the religious duties of his father. He works for the father. And there are some here, you're religious. You're not rebellious. You're religious. And yet, in the prodigal son's story, we don't see what happens with the older brother. Does he get to go to the party? We don't know. The older brother represents Israel, but their older brother also represents religious people. Listen, it is going to, I've made this, because I believe God's called me to this, the, the, the ministry to the Bible Belt, because I believe the Bible Belt is just as lost as any other place in the world. The difference in the Bible Belt and the rest of the world is the rest of the world knows it, but Bible Belt doesn't. There's a lot of older brothers in this room. There's a lot of older brothers in our region who are fully confident in their own minds that they're saved but have no relationship with Jesus Christ. They are the religious lost. And whether you're rebellious or religious, the truth is Jesus saves. That's the second anchor hold of Christ is that he will save anyone and everyone who repents and believes in him. They just had Flourish last night, and or excuse me, uh, yesterday morning, and uh, Flourish was our event for uh, the ladies, and I keep hearing uh, the amazing stories of what took place last night, uh, but one of the things that Joy shared with me among the many other victories and stories, there was over 430 women nearly here uh, yesterday, uh, awesome, yeah, awesome moment. But one of the things that excited me the most is they had a, a small card and, and all of these women kind of filled out that card and gave prayer requests and their next steps in Jesus. And, and Joy shared this with, uh, with some of us last night or with me last night that, that there were nine women yesterday who came to this event who marked, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus Christ. And I don't know those nine women's stories. Yeah, we can celebrate that for a second. That's where, the, uh, that's where the fun begins for us as a staff as we begin to, to follow up with them. But what I know about every one of those nine women is I don't know their stories. I don't even know their names. I haven't even seen their cards. But what I do know is there is not a single woman on one of those cards or was there last night or even here today that Jesus Christ will not save. His blood is bigger and grander and wider than any rebellious sin. One drop of blood is grander than the worst sin of your life. A season of sin. A lifetime of sin. One drop of his blood. Jesus is not only sovereign, he saves. The second reason why, or the third reason why Jesus Christ is the anchor of our lives is not only he's in control, not only does he save us, but second, or thirdly, he sanctifies us. Look right with me in verse 11. 
For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, we're going to explain that here in just a moment, are all from one Father. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, or brethren and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, verse 13, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has chosen me. I love this passage of scripture because we don't talk about these attributes enough. Okay, The first thing that we see in this passage of scripture is that he sanctifies. Okay, That word sanctifies, it is a, uh, it is a, a very uh, theologically important term for us to understand. So first, Jesus saves us in a moment. Boom, you're saved, justified, born again. And then, over the course of the rest of your life, he begins a process known in Scripture as sanctification. Where, and uh, Wayne Grudem has a really good definition of it. I've got it there on the screen, and, or I'll read it, and you can see it as well if, it, if we've got it. But sanctification is a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and more and more like Christ in our actual lives. I love this. It's a progressive work, meaning that it continues. It keeps going throughout your life, even when you sin, even when you falter, even when you doubt Him, even when you're mad at Him. This process continues, but it's not just God working in you. It's also you showing up and saying, God, work in me. That's why we want and are so passionate as a staff to have you get in God's Word. Because when you get in God's Word and you begin to pray in the Spirit of God daily and weekly, Jesus goes to work in your life in ways that you have never known were even possible. There are some people in this room who literally have been born again 40 years ago, and yet you are as mature spiritually as a three-year-old. And the reason why is you have not let God sanctify your life through spending time in his word and prayer. And you have believed for your whole life that the Bible is too hard to understand and that Jesus is good enough just to save you but not to work in your life, to let him do what he wants to do in your life. He doesn't want to just save you and give you a ticket to heaven. He wants to make you more like himself. He wants you to become the person that he has saved you to be here and now so that it can be used by him for his will and his glory until he brings you home. And so it is a progressive work of God and man where you show up and say, God, work in me. Examine my heart. I'm in your word. Open my eyes. And where he shows up as well. It's like a workout. You can't get in shape just thinking about exercising. You can't get in shape going to the gym. You get in shape when you put the work in. But here's what's crazy. You can't control your muscles growing. You can't control your lungs having a greater capacity to run. You can't control your legs getting more in shape. That's something that happens internally. You don't determine that. You don't have to decide that. Your body does that for you. And it's a really great understanding of what sanctification looks like. You show up and put the work in. And then the Spirit of God comes in and starts working in ways you've never known possible. Ways that you could not do on your own. Paul tells us it's God who brings the growth. And Jesus not only is sovereign over your life and over everything that ever existed. Two, he not only saves you, but he also stays with you and he sanctifies you. Are you letting him sanctify you today? Are you letting Jesus work in your life? And I love he, how he describes it. Being free from sin. So the question you have to ask is, okay, five years ago I got saved. Am I less like my old self than I am today? Do I still struggle with the same sins I did 15 years ago that I still do? I still struggle with those same sins. If you are, then there's a great indication that you are not allowing the sanctification process to work in you. You were saved to have victory over those sins. You were saved to have victory over depression and anxiety and shame and guilt. And that doesn't mean that you are going to be perfect. It means that you are being perfected by Christ. A great indication that you are walking with Jesus is that you look back on yourself five years, one year ago, five months ago, 25 years ago, and say, man, I don't even look like the same person anymore because he has set me free from that negativity and that gossip and that slander and that materialism and pride and lust. I am not that person anymore. So sanctification is you being free from sin and then also being more like Christ. It, it, very simply, it's, it's, it's you saying... Are you letting Jesus help you say no to sin and yes to him? Sanctification is a process where you are able to say no to sin and yes to him. You know, the church got it wrong for a long time. 
We thought that following Jesus was just this side. What you don't do. You don't drink. You don't cuss. You don't gamble. You don't dance. You don't do this. You don't do that. And some of y'all grew up in churches like that. All Jesus was was a rule keeper over your life. And if you got out of line, wham! Religion. Jesus didn't just come to make you more moral. He came to free you from that sin, but also he came to free you to live in obedience to him. You know where you find life and life to the fullest? In the middle of both of those things. Being constantly freed from sin. Some of you came, and I I didn't even make a note to say this. Some of you came today to hear the truth, this truth right here. You do not have to continue to be a slave to the sin that is choking your life right now. You do not have to continue living in your addiction of pornography. You do not have to continue to live in your addiction or your or your 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 chokehold of anxiety on your life. That does not have to continue to be your story. That is not your testimony, and that is not that is that is not Jesus' will for your life. He desires long-term victory over you, and it may not happen today. Some of you may. But if you continue to show up and say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, fix me. Jesus, cleanse me. Jesus, work in me. Jesus, teach me. He will. And he will work powerfully in your life because he wants to sanctify you. But also, look at this. We don't talk about this enough. He also wants to celebrate you. He wants to celebrate you. Look what he says here. And he spends the majority of his time here on this truth. I love this. He literally says, I've sanctified them and they're all from one father. For which reason? Listen to this. He's not ashamed to call them brethren. And then he quotes three different Old Testament passages of looking forward to what Jesus, the relationship between Jesus and you. Look what it says here. I will proclaim your name, meaning the brethren. I will proclaim your name to the brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise, and I will put my trust in him, meaning God. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. What Jesus is doing here is he's saying, I am celebrating you. Literally, there's some people. John 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer. And Jesus is praying, sometimes I think, against us. Because sometimes we often pray like, God, heal this person or help this person. Or God, would you please make this person live longer? And Jesus is literally praying the opposite. God, if they're a follower of him, he's saying, God, bring them to me. Bring them to me. Why? Why is he praying that? Because he loves his children. He wants so desperately to be with them that in his prayer, in John 17, he says, God, I long to be with them. I will celebrate them in the midst of God the Father. Some of you came in here with the lowest self-esteem imaginable. You are so down on yourself. You are the greatest critic of yourself. And what you need is not a sermon. What you need is to hear from the very throne of heaven, if you're saved, what Jesus says about you. He's literally saying, I celebrate you. I am excited about you. He sanctifies us and he celebrates us. I want to show you a picture. You're going to recognize one person and not recognize the other. I think we'll see it. Maybe not. Yeah, there it is. So right there on the right. Anybody know who that is? I'll give you a hint. Thank you. Thank you. You were going to make me go all the way down into it, though, right? Why aren't you? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's Usain Bolt. Literally the fastest man on the planet who has ever lived. He's, he's, he's a brilliant track and field star. But I mean, y'all know who that guy is beside him. You might think that's, maybe that's his dad or an uncle. It's none of those. That guy's name's Glenn. Glenn Mills. And Glenn was Hussein, Usain Bolt's trainer, his coach. Usain Bolt went to, I think, four Olympics. I mean, for nearly 20 years, this man, for most of Usain's Olympic career, got up at 4 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, 5 in the morning, was preparing workouts and training regimens, healing processes. Then he shows up, when Usain shows up and is at every workout, he is helping him in every step, coaching him on every single lap, coaching him on every single sprint, with him in the pool, training him. He never leaves him. And then what you're seeing here is Usain Bolt had just won one of the biggest races of his career. And look what you got right there. Glenn. And what's he doing? He's celebrating him. He's pointing at him. Dude, you did it. 
When I saw this picture, when I read this passage, I, I, I thought, that's a really good indication of what Jesus is going to look like on the day we get to heaven. That guy poured his life into making this guy the athlete that he was. Jesus Christ is pouring everything into your sanctification, into you becoming more like him. He is showing up before. Scripture tells us he sings over us while we're sleeping. He is awake when we are asleep, and he is, he is watching and praying. Scripture tells us Jesus is praying for you. Did you know that? That Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God praying for you. And then as you're going through this life and as you're experiencing all these things, Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He wants you to have victory over all those sins in your life. And not only does he want you to have victory, but he also wants to use you in his life. He wants you to work together with him to bring more people to him, which is an insane privilege. Wild to think about. So he's putting the work in to sanctify us, to train us. And then one day and every day, he celebrates us. He celebrates us to the Father. Dad, look at my children. Look at my brothers and my sisters. Look at my, as he says in the desert, my friends. He brags on you. Well, Blake, you don't understand what I've done. Jesus isn't bragging on me. He sees the real me, and he's not very pleased with me. You know what he looks at you? You know what he sees when he looks at you if you're born again, you're saved? You know what he sees? His blood. He sees a stamp over you that says, Purchased by the righteous Son of God. He sanctifies and he celebrates. Let's look at the last thing that he does, the last piece of his anchoring ministry. Not only is he sovereign, not only does uh, he save, not only does he sanctify, but lastly, Jesus succeeds. I'm going to invite the band back up as we bring all this together. Y'all don't have to rush. Just take your time. But we're going to bring this together this morning. Verse 14. Let's, let's finish here. It says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. It's referring to Jesus becoming exactly like us in human form. He was 100% man and 100% God at the same time. That through death... He might render powerless him, this is referring to Satan, who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham, that's us. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become merciful, a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. And verse 18. For since he himself was tempted in, in that which he has suffered. He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. The last truth that I think the author is really wanting to highlight here is Jesus succeeds. And he succeeds over two things. You have them there in your notes. The first is this. He is successful in crushing Satan. Look what he says here. That because Jesus died on the cross and resurrected from the grave, he has now rendered powerless him who had power over death, meaning the enemy, Satan himself. That before Jesus did what he did, the enemy had power over death. And now, because of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, he has crushed the head of Satan. Many people think that it's like God and Satan at this grand war. And like they're both just like, you know, just back and forth, like two boxers in a ring. That's not biblical image of God and the enemy. The enemy is powerless. The enemy can only do what God allows him to do. We see that very clearly from the book of Job. They are not at this, this yin and yang fight back and forth. God is completely powerful over Satan. He was in eternity past and he will be in eternity future. Why? Because Jesus Christ rendered him powerless by his death and by his resurrection. We give Satan way too much credit. He is successful in crushing Satan. But then lastly, as we bring this together this morning, he's successful in caring for the saints. Look at verse 16. He doesn't give help to angels. Jesus is not there like rendering aid and care to the angels who are in heaven. Do you know who he's rendering aid and care to? What does it say? 
the descendants of Abraham, the descendants of faith, the church, those who are born again, who have repented and believed. And I love how he ends it there. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, I think that's very important for us to realize. Jesus not only was tempted in every way that we are, but he also suffered in ways that we cannot fathom or understand. Jesus is not unable to sympathize with you as you go through pain and loss and suffering and trials. There is no trial or temptation that you are facing or dealing with that Jesus Christ was not also hit with. And like Blake, you don't understand, I, I, Jesus didn't battle with depression. I've got depression. Really? Read the book of Isaiah. He was a man of sorrows, much acquainted with grief. Well, you don't understand, he, he, he doesn't know the types of temptations that, that I've faced. Really? Did you sit out in a desert for 40 days and 40 nights fasting and then Satan himself showed up at your doorstep and tempting you with all the power of the kingdoms of the earth? And while you were hanging on a cross, for your sins were you able to then call out to God and bring down legions upon legions of angels because you were tempted to quit early no in all those things Christ suffered and endured and went through all the temptations and yet he went through them perfectly perfectly and so when you're trying to figure out, God, I, I, I need help with this situation. I need help with this problem. And God's the last person I want to go to because he doesn't understand. That's false. He does understand. He cares for you. And he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. In 1834, there was a man named Edward very common, simple man. And he was a really great cabinet maker. And later on in his teenage years, a little bit past his teenage years, he didn't grow up in a Christian home. Didn't grow up hearing about Jesus. But in his teenage years, he gave his life to Christ and was saved. 1820s. He becomes a very successful cabinet maker. But he also becomes a Baptist pastor. A very small church. In England. And Edward Mote one day was walking to his parish, his little office where he was going to study. And there was a phrase that the Holy Spirit kept bringing across his mind. Here was the phrase My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest prank, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. Edward Moat went on to write what we all know as On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. When darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. I thought it was incredibly fitting for us to celebrate this morning with this hymn on Christ the solid rock I stand. There's no, there's no better way to highlight what the author is trying to highlight about Jesus than us realizing in every aspect of life, in every difficulty, in every struggle, in every sin, we have an anchor that holds because he's sovereign. He saves, he sanctifies, and he succeeds. Can't say that about us. <laughs> We're not sovereign. Can't save ourselves. Can't even make ourselves any better, much less sanctify us. And left to ourselves, we don't succeed. Yeah, we might make some money, maybe have a semi-happy life. But we can do nothing for the success of our eternal lives. And so this morning... As the band leads us in worship, this is your moment to respond. Some of you need to respond by being saved. And you know it. You're here this morning. Maybe you're the religious son. Maybe you're the rebellious daughter. But you need to be saved today. 
Because God's love through Jesus Christ is not worth running from anymore. Let his kindness today and his mercy lead you to repentance. Why don't you be the next person who's baptized next Sunday or the next? Because you give your life to Jesus Christ. Some of you need to be saved. And some of you, those of you who are saved, drop the anchor. Stop letting your life go crazy and drift all over the place. Stop letting your circumstances and your chaos, stop letting what people are saying about you or what people are saying to you, stop letting those voices be louder and drop the anchor of Jesus Christ, who is sovereign, who saves you, who sanctifies you, and who succeeds in crushing your enemy and who cares for you. Drop the anchor this morning. And what that looks like is you saying, God, forgive me for trying to paddle on my own. Forgive me for trying to take life into my own hands. Be the anchor of my soul again. Fight for me in these battles. Remind me that you saved me. You're sanctifying me. You succeed when I can't. I don't know what dropping the anchor for you this morning, what it looks like. It may mean you repent of sin. It may be you give up something you've been worrying about for a long time. It may be you let go of some bitterness that you've got between God or maybe somebody else. And I tell you what, bitterness towards other people will kill you slowly because it makes you not the best person that God's called you to be. Some of y'all need to drop it. So this morning, you respond to Christ the way His Spirit this morning is leading you to respond. Pastors will be here. If you need us to pray for you, you need to be saved, you respond to the anchor. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would save people who need to be saved and that those here this morning who are adrift, who are just letting the rhythms and the rivers of life carry them and drag them and bump them into trees, sticks, rocks. We'll drop the anchor this morning. We'll be reminded this morning of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And you would fix our lives with the anchor of your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us and and respond as Christ is leading?